Amen and good morning, friends. Welcome to Trinity United Methodist Church on this, the first Sunday of Christmas tide, as it's officially known in the the uh, liturgical season. So, it is still Christmas. We are still celebrating by the manger, and we are still just buzzing with the news that the newborn king is present. So we're going to do that in a different way today. Today is a service I love to do every year. It's called the Lesson and Carol service. I'm sure you've heard of it. What it is, is, I mean, to put it differently, it's a chance for the scripture to tell its story itself. It's unfiltered. It's not through me, through a sermon. It's just the scripture. It's the story, and it's a celebration. So we're going to be doing that today, and you're going to get to see the Christmas story in the wider context of the Bible, how it fits in with the idea of covenant, why Christmas happened, and where Christmas leads to. Hint, hint, it's Easter. So that's what we get to explore today, and I'm thrilled that you get to be here and do that with us and to hear all sorts of blessed music and to sing. Uh, Folks online, if you're looking for the worship order, as you've seen, we have a much lighter AV presence today. We don't have as many slides, so if you're looking for lyrics to the songs we're singing and the order in general, click the link in the show notes, in the show description. You'll see it right there. It'll link you to a document with everything you need on it. All right. Well, we are going to take some time to just send ourselves in a minute. But uh, first, I'll remind you, if you'd like to bring a tithe or offering, online folks, there's a link in the show notes. People here, we've got a little plate in back, and thank you for your generosity and how it continues to shape our community in the image of Christ. Okay, friends, let's take a moment and just be present here once more. It is still Christmas. You may not have felt like it yesterday, but it is still Christmas. The Savior is still here to greet you. So let's greet him back with this open hearts, open minds, and open souls. Amen.
you join with me in the call to worship that's in your bulletin. And folks online, once again, click on the link in your show notes and you'll have the worship order with you. To sit, today we say goodbye to the old year and look hopefully into the new. Though the darkness is deep, the light of the world guides our way. Even though we don't really know what is to come, we know that God is with us. Quietly, reverently, we open our hearts to the Spirit. Praise be to God. Through the story of worship, let us hear about the God who was and is and is to be. Amen. Before we begin the, with the prayer of preparation, I'd like to just invite us real fast. If you've got any joys and concerns we can lift up during this prayer, just please feel free and share them. Online folks, that includes you all. So is there anything we can add into this time of prayer before we start singing? Karen. So uh, I believe I heard a niece, Lori, who needs prayers, and she's a Marine. Yes, indeed. So we happily lift her up and all our other men and women in the armed forces. In the armed forces, we are thankful for all they do for us. Any others? I'll just say it was a joy to be with family yesterday at Christmas. It was a joy to feast and celebrate. And it was a joy the day before that Christmas Eve. We had over 100 in worship here on Christmas Eve night. That was nice. So we did have issues with the live stream. Unfortunately, it was nothing we did because all of our equipment worked perfectly. But a lot more people are streaming at Friday night at 7 p.m. than they are Sunday morning at 10. So there was just no internet bandwidth around here at all. So the good news is the recording we made on the computer is absolutely fine. We will be putting that up later so you can see the service in its entirety, and it turned out fantastic. So if you'd like to watch that, it'll be available. Okay, friends, let's take all of our joys and our concerns, our highs and our lows and everything we are, and let's bring it to God in a time of prayer. Join me, please. Dear people of God, as the season of Christmas continues, it is our responsibility and joy to hear once more the message of the angels, to go to Bethlehem, to remember this and let the experience transform you. For a new year is dawning, and soon Advent will be a mere memory. So let us take the most important parts of that story today. Let us again hear the story of God's loving purpose from the time of our creation until the glorious redemption brought on by us and his holy child, Jesus Christ. Let's join together in prayer, lifting up all of our joys and concerns. Almighty God, bless us with grace. In our singing, in our experiencing of your story, help us see how our stories our lives tie in with yours. May we see how Christ gives the joys of everlasting life and be inspired to claim the space you are holding for us in the kingdom to come. Join us now, O Holy Spirit of life, we pray. Amen. The first reading comes to us out of Genesis. And it begins the course that led to Easter so long ago. Traditionally, the setting for this reading is the Garden of Eden, a lush paradise where God lived in harmony with all of creation. Regardless of whether it was a literal location or not, the underlying message of this garden story is undeniable. It tells us that humans were meant to live in peace with each other and our Creator. Unfortunately, something happens that breaks the unity in this story. Humans assert themselves over each other and the divine. The result is broken relationships. Sin enters the world as the pure connection between humans and their God is interrupted. The Bible depicts this moment happening in Genesis 3, 8 through 18. 
and 17 through 19. Hear the word of the Lord. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man, Adam, and his wife heard the Lord walking among them in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God in the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Adam replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked, the Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, It was the woman you gave me who gave me that fruit, and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, What have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied, and that's why I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. And to the man he said, Since you listened and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat from, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow you will have food to eat, until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you shall return. May God bless our continued hearing and pondering of the word this morning. All right, friends, we are pairing that first reading with the first Noel. So I'll invite you to stand as you're able and grab the pew Bibles for the words. The number is number 245, first Noel, verses 1, 2, and 4.
Our first reading had a story of a mistake made, of a relationship with God damaged, of sin entering the world. The second starts to describe God's response to that. Thankfully, God is not one to stand by and let creation spin out of control due to our brokenness. If we humans want freedom, God will work with that. God will still manage to be in community with us. But our relationship would have to be in a different form than what it had been. It would have to be invitational, a covenantal partnership, a holy alliance meant to gradually draw people back together with each other and the divine. Scripture says that God first proposed this arrangement, this covenant, to a man named Abram and his wife, Sarai. They accepted and everything changed for them. This covenant warranted new approaches, new dreams, and new names, as we hear in Genesis 17, verses 1 through 9 and 15 through 16. Hear now the word of the Lord. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. And I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee you countless descendants. At this, Abram fell face down on the ground. Then God said to him, this is how my covenant with you will work. I will make you a father of the multitude of nations. What's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham, for you will be the father of these many nations. Yes, I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will come from many nations, and kings and queens shall be among them. I will confirm this covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And I will give you the entire land of Cana, where you now live as a foreigner. It will go to you and to your descendants. It will be your possession forever, and I will be your God. And God said to Abraham, your responsibility is to obey the terms of this covenant. You and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. And God said, regarding Sarai, your wife, Abraham, her name is no longer Sarai. From now on, she will be called Sarah. And I will bless her. Yes, I will give you a son from her. I will bless her richly, and she will become the mother of the many nations. Kings of nations will be among her descendants. May God bless the continued hearing and pondering of the word this morning.
Amen. So we've gone from a mistake to God trying to make a new relational arrangement to seeing how that relational arrangement, that covenant, fared with the people. The descendants of Abraham did live under the terms of the covenant for many years. Yet, it failed to bring people completely back together with each other and God. Some did walk closely with their creator, but for every leader and every person who did God's will, bringing people closer together and bringing forth an era of peace, there were many more kings and people who went further astray. This led to another dark time. God's people placed their faith in foreign gods and political might, ignoring the words of the prophets who were sent in to help bring them back. It led to ruin. First, an empire from Assyria invaded, and later the Babylonians. The conquerors destroyed the Jewish kingdom and hauled its citizens into exile. The people were defeated and broken. They thought their connection with God was broken as well. Yet even ex in exile, they found that God had not abandoned them. Looking back on their scriptures to learn from this mistake, the people began to read long-neglected prophecies, which told them that God was about to create a new covenant, a new arrangement with them. But it wouldn't be merely God's Spirit who did this like it had been in the past. This time, the divine representative who sealed this covenant would be a king. This person, this long-awaited ruler, became known as the Messiah. All throughout the exile and the times after, the people looked for the Messiah's coming. They awaited for that king who would take up David's long, vacant throne in Jerusalem. The announcement of this renewed covenant and the later prediction of the Messiah comes to us from two prophets. The first is Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. Hear now the word of the Lord. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them out of the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, even though I loved them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with you, the people of Israel, after those days. The Lord said, I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will still be their God, and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord, for everyone from the least and the greatest will already know me. And the Lord said, I will forgive their wickedness. I will forgive their sins. And I will never remember them from here on in. And from our second prophet, Isaiah 9, 1 through 7, the verse we've been hearing a lot during this Advent season, this passage. Isaiah writes, Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali will be humbled, but there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs to the Jordan and the sea, that land will be filled with glory. For the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in the land of deep darkness, that light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel, and its people shall rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice before the harvest, like warriors who are dividing their plunder. For you are, will break the yoke of slavery, and you will lift the heavy burden from every shoulder. You will break the oppressor's rod, just like you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. Yes, they will be fuel for the fire. For a child is born to us. 
a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and his peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all of eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. May God bless our continued hearing and pondering of the word this morning. Friends, I now invite you to stand as you're able. Our second carol this morning is Hark the Herald Angel Sing. It is hymn 240. Be seated. So the wait began for this individual, this Messiah, this King who was going to come and bring this new covenant to fruition. Empires rose and fell in that span. The Jewish people ended back in their homeland, but again, they were under foreign rule. Each subsequent ruling nation brutalized God's faithful people. Hope was increasingly low, and the people cried out, How long, O Lord? How long must we wait before this expected Messiah comes? Everyone was certain that this new king would arrive in a center of power. The religious elites in Jerusalem, they would be the first to know. The rich and the wealthy, he would be born among them. So imagine everyone surprised when a star appeared, not over the capital of Jerusalem as people hoped, but in the poorer agricultural regions outside of town. Then rumors started flying of a miraculous child born in Bethlehem to two scared teenagers. Luke records this story happening like this. This is Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. Hear now the word of the Lord. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout all the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria, 
and all returned to their ancestral homes to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancestral home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of God's glory surrounded them. And they were terrified. But the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. Then suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, all praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth with those whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let us see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there with them was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone about what had happened and what the angel had said to them. All who heard the shepherds' story were astonished. Yet Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, for it had been just like the angel had told them. May God continue blessing our hearing and pondering of the word this morning.
demonstrations of cosmic power that made it clear that this newborn baby was something special. Yet it was still unusual. Why would God send his servant to the poor blue-collar factory town of Bethlehem? Why were the first people to hear about the fulfillment of the new covenant the unclean shepherds working in the fields? Surely God had better people to reach out to, better places to take this message. Yet the unexpected nature of the Messiah only continued. Soon, Magi from the east arrived asking about this new king. It was extremely unexpected. God had shown pagan conjurers and astronomers the good news, while some of the rich and powerful continued to be out of the loop. Obviously, this Messiah was going to be far different than anyone thought. Matthew captures this account in chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 of his gospel writing. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we've come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this as was everyone in Jerusalem. So Herod called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of the religious law and asked them, where is this Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities in Judah, for a ruler will come out of you a ruler who will be the shepherd for my people, Israel. Then Herod called a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. And he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search for this child. And when you find him, come back to me and tell me so that I may go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went on their way, and the star they'd seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of him until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star and how it had stopped, they were overjoyed. Then they entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary. There these men bowed down and worshipped. They opened up their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to King Herod. Friends, I invite us to sing a hymn about that now. This song that we're going to sing is hymn 254 from our hymnal, We Three Kings. Please stand as you're able.
Amen. You may be seated. Perfect transition hymn for this point in our service. The first three hymns of that, or verses of that, are about the birth of Christ. Then it transitions to his passing and crucifixion, which is where we head now. Jesus of Nazareth grew up strong in the ways of the Lord. He was just as unexpected as everyone. He was just as unexpected as the predictions of things had been, of him had been. He went around teaching and preaching, and everywhere he went, people were amazed by his power and authority. He ignited a movement, but again, it wasn't the Rome-conquering, power-grabbing war campaign that people thought it would be. Instead, Jesus talked about a war against sin. His conflict was with people's brokenness. His covenant, the agreement to bring people into relationship with each other and God, was not just for the Jews, but it was for the Gentiles, for all who would believe. Jesus teaching this challenged all who heard him. His call was so otherworldly that it threatened the power centers in Rome and Jerusalem alike. So plots began to hatch to end the threat that Jesus presented. Sensing this, Jesus began offering deeply mystical teachings. He would teach that God was indeed bringing a new covenant forward, but the person bringing it was no mere human. When God had said, I will bring forth this new agreement, I will take them by the hem, God had meant exactly that. The divine had become incarnate in Jesus Christ. He was God in flesh, and through his birth, ministry, and sacrifice, all would know the personal saving power of their creator. John remembers them being taught to the disciples like this. This is John 14, verses 1 through 6. Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled, but trust in God, and also trust in me. There is more than enough room in my father's house. If this is not so, would I told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am, and you will know the place to where I'm going. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus replied, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. May God continue blessing our reading and hearing and pondering of the word this morning. Come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Christ is the Lord.
Amen. In Jewish culture, the number seven is a number that symbolizes perfection, completion. So in our seventh reading, we hear about Christ being the completion of things. We'll learn more about how Christ gets to that point through Lent and the journey to Easter later on this coming year. But for now, we hear about the after effects of that. Christ's words about being the way, the truth, the life, about being one with God and God incarnate, they proved true on Easter morning. The disciples who had come to anoint his body found it missing. Then Jesus appeared and began teaching his friends once more. No one knew how it was possible, how God was working in Christ, and how this could all be. Yet, over the centuries, we've still continued to work on that problem. We've still tried to learn the paradox of God and Christ. The Apostle Paul experienced this. And in his letter to the Colossians, he expounded to other followers about how we can know Christ, how we can know God within us, and how we can live that as well. So this is from Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves in tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves in love, which binds us together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as the members of the one body, you are called to live in peace and to always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other in all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spirituals to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, let it be as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him through God the Father. So we too have received this message this morning. What started out so long ago continues to be carried out today. We are to carry the message of the Christ child to the world, eager to share all the glory he brings. In this way, Christmas never really truly ends. All are continually made new in the knowledge of Emmanuel. God is with us. And together we work with God to restore that which was lost. The Eden that is the kingdom of God can exist here and now if we try. So friends, let's remember that and live out our part of the story in the new year. And may God bless us and keep us. May God make God's face to shine upon us and to be gentle to us. And may God lift up God's countenance upon us and give us peace. Now let's begin our proclaiming of this wonderful message with our last hymn today. Please stand as we sing it together. It is hymn 251, Go Tell It on the Mountain.
I'll invite you to be seated. And let's join together in a concluding prayer of joy. And static. Are we about to blow something up? Okay. All right, a concluding prayer of joy. Gracious God, through story and song, we have heard the immensity of what you've given us. You've given us freedom, and yet you walk alongside us, still trying to draw us into relationship. You give us covenant, a way to draw us into community with our neighbor and with you. And when we continue to pull away, you continue to pursue. You go as far as to send your son, your very nature incarnate to us. We have felt that nature, God. We have been blessed by that Savior. Now help us to go out and bless others with that knowledge. May we live out the rest of the story we heard about service, about healing, about taking good news to the poor and oppressed, about lifting up the downtrodden and challenging the powers that be. May we do all these things in your name. May we continue to bless others as we have been blessed so we will know that wonder that you have in Christ fully someday. And we will be united with you and each other in the kingdom of God. Yes, God, we pray. Help us to continue this course, our course in your great narrative. And propel us along today as we repeat the words that your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Ah, I don't know about you, but I feel pretty good right now, being able to sing, be able to hear the story again, and... Ah, just uplifting to the soul. So thank you for being with me in that. Some announcements and ways we can minister in the world this week. Uh, we've got a fair amount going on for the week after Christmas. Uh, first of all, this Wednesday, at starting at 6 p.m., either downstairs if you want to be with us in person or on Zoom digitally if you want to join in from afar, uh, we're going to be having our annual church conference meeting. That's our business meeting where we approve a slate of leadership, where we talk about um, salary packages, where we bring up issues that are going on in the church. That's this Wednesday, and I would heartily invite you to be there for that. We're going to be sharing some uh, information about where our church is going or where our church is at going into 2022. Um, people have been wondering how we're coming out of the flood stage, and we've got information on that, what we're looking towards in the next 12 months. So this is vital information, and I would love to be for you to be there to hear it because it's going to be important as we start off a fresh year. So please, Wednesday, 6 p.m., downstairs in the Fellowship Hall or on Zoom. There will be a link and information that goes out about that here, I think, tomorrow. So check that out. Next, um, beginning of the year, two things happen. One, we're going to start reopening the office. So the second week of January, we're going to start opening the office, likely on Wednesdays. So I will be here 10 to 2, and we're going to start lining up coverage for the additional days we're going to try to open. Uh, SPR is still going to be working on that, so give us a little bit of time to figure out exactly what routine works for us. But we're going to have somebody here again, so more normality is returning. Amen to that. Second note about the new year, if you've been bringing in crosses for us to hang on the wall downstairs, after the first service of the new year, when we start taking down all the decorations, we're going to take those crosses and start hanging them up. So if you haven't gotten yours in, no worries. We'll take it up to the deadline and probably even after that. But just in case you have one on your table at home or a desk and have been waiting to bring it in, we're going to start hanging them up here soon. So please note that. All right, next, another New Year's announcement. We need leaders of all forms and shapes. So we need liturgists, we need uh, worship leaders, we need ushers and greeters, we need AV techs, we need people to help with fellowship, which will return in the new year. 
We need a lot of help. So if you're feeling called to help out, just come talk to me, and I will tell you where you can fit in. All right, lastly, I'm hoping the announcements kind of even out here soon. We're past the Christmas season, so it should get a little bit easier. Lastly, the poinsettias. If you ordered a poinsettia and um, in honor of somebody, you may pick that up after worship, and thank you for decorating our sanctuary. Also remember to check, see if anybody has sent you any Christmas cards in the Christmas card box in back. All right, that was a lot of words, a lot of story, but... What's important now is the story we go out to share. So I'll invite us to stand as we receive the benediction. We are a part of a story that defines not only the world, but all of creation. We are key players in this drama of grace and peace, and we have been given that message once more to bring to the world. So go forth and do that now. Bring the Christmas story. Bring the news of a Savior. Bring the evidence of God's love made human to all you meet, and bless them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and go out in peace. Amen, and a continued Merry Christmas to all. We'll see you next week. Hi, how you doing? Yeah.